It was very friendly and very easy. You be nice to me. Maybe I'll tell you some things about this place. I thought he was a very shy man, very vulnerable. I just like to pet nice things, smooth things. Lon Chaney Jr. has one legacy, and that's the Universal Horror Films. My grandfather loved it. He loved to act. He was the lumbering Lenny in Of Mice and Men. He was Lawrence Talbot in The Wolfman. He played the mummy, Frankenstein's monster, and Dracula's son. But Lon Chaney Jr. was also a complex individual who spent most of his life living in the shadow of his father, a father who just happened to be one of the greatest stars in the history of motion pictures. In 1906, Lon Chaney Sr. and his wife, Cleva Creighton, were struggling vaudevillians who were barely making a living playing the circuit. It didn't help that the marriage was plagued by Lon's jealousy and Cleva's flirtatious nature. It also didn't help that Cleva was suffering through a difficult pregnancy. On a freezing winter night in a small cabin outside Oklahoma City, Creighton Tull Chaney was born. Seriously premature and weighing only two pounds, the infant barely survived. When the baby was born, the baby wasn't responding. It was almost as if uh, Lon Chaney Jr. had been born stillborn. And finally it was Lon Sr. who stepped forward and took the baby from the doctor's arms and rushed out of the door of the cottage they were living in, ran down to Belle Isle Lake, grabbing an axe along the way, and smashed through the ice on the top of the lake and took the baby's body and put it underneath the ice-cold water. And when he brought it back out, the baby was crying. As Creighton's health improved, so did his parents' careers. The Shaneys began touring the United States with a company of vaudevillians. It was here that the young boy would learn the rigors of life on the road. If you're not talking about the proverbial baby born in a theatrical trunk, you're pretty doggone close to it. But he was small enough that he would sleep in dresser drawers in theatrical boarding houses. He would sleep in shoe boxes on the train next to his mother. And this went on all through his early childhood. A string of touring engagements took the Shaneys to Chicago, Denver, and finally to San Francisco, where Cleva established herself as a popular cabaret singer. It was a very rough childhood for Creighton because he never really was able to put down roots in any one place, and these were his formative years. He was constantly on the road. As a result, uh, Lon Chaney Jr. spent a lot of his time backstage being taken care of by chorus girls. Now, those were his babysitters. But as rough as Creighton's childhood had been, nothing could have prepared the boy for one evening in 1913 when his mother, following a heated backstage argument with Lon, stood in the wings of the Majestic Theater in Los Angeles and swallowed a vial of bichloride of mercury in a dramatic suicide attempt. Prompt medical attention saved her life, but the caustic poison permanently damaged her vocal cords and put an end to both her career and her stormy marriage. Granted a divorce, Lon struggled desperately to establish himself in the early motion picture industry, and prove that he could provide a suitable home for his eight-year-old son. But the courts were not convinced. After an emotional legal struggle, Lon Chaney was forced to place his son in a foster home for children of divorce and disaster. I think he had to spend some time there, which wouldn't be good for any child, really. So I think his childhood was quite rough growing up. When Lon sent the boy to live with his deaf-mute parents, Creighton learned sign language and pantomime. He also developed a profoundly sensitive and compassionate nature. At the age of 10 to 12, he's already hitchhiking out of town to go up and pick apricots and fruit orchards to make money for a few cents a basket. And he enjoyed doing this. He was a gregarious, pleasant, regular kind of fellow. 
With the opening of Universal Studios in 1915, Lon found steady employment as a character actor and, for the first time, financial stability. He also married again, this time to Hazel Hastings, a former vaudeville performer. Finally, Lon Chaney was able to care for Creighton himself. Over the next four years, Lon appeared in over 100 films, usually in bit parts and character roles. But what became increasingly apparent to Universal casting directors was the actor's incredible facility with elaborate and often exotic makeups. Using grease paint, putty, wax, and a variety of wigs, false teeth, and prosthetics, he played everything from clowns and gangsters to exotic villains. But none advanced his career more than the Miracle Man, in which he painfully contorted his body to impersonate a bogus cripple in a faith healing scheme. Before morphing, there was Lon Chaney, the man of a thousand faces. Uh, he probably uh, put a couple of hundred actors out of work who might have played roles individually, but uh, he was able to change his face and his form in so many different ways that I think if you looked in a dictionary in those days under the word unique, it would have said Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney Sr. was a larger-than-life figure. He was one of Hollywood's greatest actors. He was probably the most famous character actor in the history of Hollywood, a man that was able to play ordinary people, deformed human beings, anything but attractive human beings, and remain a leading man throughout the, the, the short span of his career. Incredibly talented. Shaney's self-taught mastery of bizarre and frightening character makeup reached its pinnacle in two films for Universal, The Hunchback of Notre Dame and The Phantom of the Opera. Man of a Thousand Faces was certainly wasn't any exaggeration. I'll never forget the makeup he had for Hunchback. It looked like he had walnuts in his cheeks. They stood out. He was able to use his body in a manner that he was really the hunchback. He was so athletic. He was able to do stunt work that was most remarkable. He was one of a kind. I, I, I don't think there's ever been anybody that to match what he could do. I was a ballerina in the Phantom of the Opera, and I think that was the year 1925. <laughs> I was in some of those scenes where the Phantom was supposed to be loitering or coming down and we were running here and there, you know, being afraid. His makeup was really frightening. It was pretty ghastly. It was mainly white, ghostly. And then his eyes was sort of black. It was eerie, creepy. He really had it on all the way. But all of these characters, it seemed like they were ugly, maybe, and frightening, but there was something pathetic about them. You had a feeling they weren't evil. There was something there that was good about them. He was one of the greatest stars and the greatest makeup artist ever. Moving to MGM in 1925, Lon Chaney became one of America's hottest box office attractions. As the son of a world-famous film star, Creighton was awed by his father's talent and lifestyle. Secretly, he harbored a desire to follow in Lon's footsteps. It was only natural that he would want to go in the show business. It was the only life he had ever known, and he'd certainly seen the master at work. But despite his own good fortune in films, Lon did everything he could to discourage his son from even considering a Hollywood career. The senior Shaney had raised his son to be a man's man, where hunting and fishing were important, and a career in business, not the arts, was encouraged. He went to Hollywood High School, and he tried to make the football team, but surprisingly, though he was rather tall, he didn't have the bulk on him at the time, didn't make the team. As soon as his father finds out about an interest in acting, he immediately transferred him to a business school. He wanted to toughen him up. It was his only son. Maybe he felt that's what he would need in life, you know, to get by and stand on his own two feet. Obeying his father's orders, Creighton enrolled at the Commercial Experts Training Institute in Los Angeles, where he became a plumbing contractor. In 1926, he married Dorothy Hinckley, entered her family's construction business, and started a family of his own. 
But in 1930, Creighton's comfortable middle-class life would forever be changed by news that his father was dying of throat cancer. Following his successful transition to talkies with the release of a sound version of The Unholy Three, Hollywood's man of a thousand faces was being heralded as the man of a thousand voices. Poised on the brink of even greater fame, MGM was planning all talking remakes of his most famous roles, and Universal Pictures planned to star him in their production of Dracula. But none of this would come to pass. On August 26, 1930, Lon Chaney died in Los Angeles. The world mourned the death of one of its greatest stars, and Hollywood producers scrambled to find actors who could inherit his unique roles. But for Creighton Tull Chaney, the loss of his father came at a time when his personal fortunes were at their lowest point. As the Depression was sweeping the country, the young man's plumbing business failed. Forced to pursue other work, he set his sights on the one career his father had forbidden. Creighton Chaney was about to become an actor. In 1932, at the age of 26, Creighton Chaney gave up the plumbing trade and made his screen debut in Girl Crazy, the first of six pictures for RKO Studios. He was born to act, and I think it was his destiny to go back to, to acting or the theater. But other than bit parts in A pictures or featured parts in C pictures, the fledgling actor wasn't being taken seriously. Casting agents and producers showed little or no interest in the craggy-faced youth, unless, of course, he were willing to adopt his father's name for marquee value. For three years, Creighton Shaney toiled in near obscurity. At times, he could barely earn enough to feed his wife and two small children. Tom? Why'd you do this? It don't look right to me. To keep you from doing something you would regret. Meaning what? Punish Maitland. Morris is the man you want. Talk is cheap, but can you prove that? I can prove it as soon as we get back into town, by Maitland himself. In 1935, Creighton reluctantly agreed to change his name to Lon Shaney, Jr. I think because of the inevitable comparison to his father, he didn't want to take the name Lon. And as he kind of writes, he's, he held out against that for a long time. The studios kept trying to make him change his name. No, I don't think he wanted to be Lon Chaney Jr. He wanted to be an actor on his own. He said, they made me so poor I had to take it. With his new name came more and at times better roles. In 1936, he appeared in his first science fiction film, the Republic Pictures serial Undersea Kingdom, playing an evil henchman in the underwater world of Atlantis. Professionally, things were looking up, but that same year, Shaney's marriage of eight years ended in divorce. Obviously, a stray business and the entertainment business don't mix too well, and I think they caused a lot of hardships. I think it was a very painful divorce. I think she was very hurt by it. They never talked about each other too much, I think because of the pain of the divorce and the split up of the family also. One reason for the breakup was Shaney's affair with a young actress and model named Patricia Beck. She was a, a starlet for the studio, and that's where he met her, was when he went into the motion picture business. And they just fell in love, and I'm sure that was part of the breakup also. Within a few days after his divorce, Lon and Patsy were married. That same year also saw prosperity in the form of a contract with 20th Century Fox. All hands stand clear! For the next two years, Lon Chaney Jr. appeared in no less than 30 films. We'll print it in every paper in the country. All right. Will you marry me? Uh, what? Come on, Sergeant. The lady's waiting for an answer. What is it? Yes or no? Yes. Boy, what a story! Congratulations! 30 grand's a lot of money, Nick. 
I might get a little sore if I found out you pulled a fast one. You laid the bet off, didn't you? <laughs> you think it was his own dough he lost the way he's beefing about it. I didn't have time to lay the bet off. So I'm the only guy that lost. That's too bad. Well, so long. Feel like talking now? I got nothing to talk about. Gonna be stubborn, huh? Take him in the next room, Eric. But although the parts he received provided good training, few would be impressed by Lon's fleeting moments on screen. In the mid-30s, he actually went to acting school to try and improve his talent. And after a few sessions, the acting coach said, uh, hey, you're, you're, you're good enough to teach part of the class. Frustrated by his Hollywood offerings, Lon turned to the burgeoning Los Angeles stage. Taking classes and learning his craft, he was soon given an opportunity to audition for the role of a lifetime as the powerful yet dim-witted Lenny in the West Coast production of John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. Originated on Broadway by Broderick Crawford, the part of Lenny seemed tailor-made for the lumbering, good-natured Lon. The production and Lon's performance became a tremendous critical and commercial success. But when veteran Hollywood producer Hal Roach purchased the screen rights, it was Broderick Crawford, not Lon Jr., who was slated by director Lewis Milestone to play Lenny. Cheney didn't have an agent, and Cheney desperately wanted the part of Lenny in the film. And he was told the part was already taken. He has the audacity to go to Lewis Milestone directly and implore him to test him for the role of Lenny. Lewis Milestone says, well, the part's already taken, but he appreciated the gumption that Cheney had showed so he allowed Cheney to portray Lenny in other tests that were given to the other members of the cast that he was screen testing. So everybody is screen testing against Lon Cheney. By the time it came to give Cheney his own test for the role of Lenny, Milestone was convinced that he had his Lenny right there already, didn't need to screen test him and didn't, and that's how he got the part. George, what do you want? where are we going? Forgot that already, did you? Oh, I forgot. I tried not to forget. Honest, I did. Okay, okay, I'll tell you again. I got nothing else to do. Might as well spend my time telling you things. You forget them, and I'll tell you again. I tried and I tried, but it didn't do no good. I'll remember about the rabbits, George. Oh, yeah. It's the only thing you can remember is them rabbits. What you covering up there? Just my pup. Just my little old pup. He's dead. He was so little. I was just playing with him, and he made like he was going to bite me. And I made like I was going to smack him. And... and then he was dead. Don't make him little. Don't let him do it. Get him, Lenny. Fight back, Lenny. You'll kill him if you fight back. George, leave him. Put your hands up, Lenny. Cheney's inspired screen portrayal of Lenny helped make Of Mice and Men one of the most talked about films of 1939. All you have to do is go back and look at Lenny and Of Mice and Men, and you see a, a Dustin Hoffman, Rain Man caliber performance. Lenny could be considered the Forrest Gump of his day, and I don't know if there's anybody in Hollywood that could have brought as much to that part as Lon Cheney Jr. at that time. Of Mice and Men received an Academy Award nomination as the year's best picture ultimately losing out to Gone with the Wind. But despite the film's success, Lon's performance didn't recommend him for the kind of complex leading roles he craved. For his next film, producer Hal Roach cast the actor as a grunting Neanderthal chieftain in 1 million BC, an implausible but exciting mix of cavemen and dinosaurs. It was a leading role, but one which led to an even greater career disappointment. He created his own makeup for 1 million BC and it was really good. I've got some great photographs of it. But because the unions were coming into effect and he wasn't allowed to do his own makeup. 
I think he could have been a, a really good makeup artist in his own right had he been allowed to. It's just important to know that here, here's the son of Lon Chaney trying at a point in his career to create a character as his father would have created it and not being allowed to do so. It was at this time that Universal Pictures was enjoying renewed interest in the kind of gothic monster films they had initiated with Dracula and Frankenstein nearly a decade before. Often starring Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, these films were eerie and atmospheric, more suggestive than literal. But the popularity of Karloff and Lugosi had peaked with Son of Frankenstein in 1939. When teamed the next year in Black Friday, the box office results were disappointing, and Universal executives searched for a new, younger personality to reinvigorate its horror tradition. Who better to fit the bill than the son of their famed Man of a Thousand Faces? Universal had dusted off an old Karloff Lugosi script called The Electric Man and cast Cheney Jr. in the role of Dynamo Dan, the Electrical Man. Lon Chaney Jr. had found a home at his father's old studio. But little did the 35-year-old actor know that his next role would catapult him into even greater fame and place him forever in the esteemed company of Karloff, Lugosi, and even his own father. Telegram, Wolfbane. Oh, I'm sick of the whole thing. I'm gonna get out of here. Oh, yeah, but is beaten by a werewolf and lives, becomes a werewolf himself. Oh, quit handing me that. You're just wasting your time. As Lawrence Talbot, the unfortunate victim of an ancient curse, Lon Chaney created the most durable horror icon of the 1940s, the Wolfman. was always most proud of the Wolfman. He would always refer to the Wolfman as, that's my baby, because he had, in a sense, created that particular monster. The role of the Wolfman clicked along with the uh, pantheon of roles like Frankenstein and uh, Dracula and Invisible Man, the Mummy, and so on, because built into it was humanity. Uh, here was a, a man who really didn't want to kill. It was beyond his control. Adding greatly to the film's success was a distinguished ensemble cast that included Claude Rains, Ralph Bellamy, Evelyn Ankers, Maria Uspenskaya, and Bela Lugosi. The Wolfman's startling appearance was the creation of Universal's makeup magician, Jack Pierce. Pierce, who had created the makeups of Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, and other classic monsters, spent more than four hours each day applying rubber, putty, and yak hair to Lon's face, hands, and feet. He said he was itching all the time. The face makeup was, you know, horrible for him, really. And then the hair, he said he was always itching. He always wanted to scratch, but he had to keep perfect pose, you know, so they could apply it and shoot it in sequence to come out like it did in the film. Released shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Wolfman struck a responsive chord with wartime audiences, providing a kind of ritual catharsis in the face of real-world horrors. The monster characters left just an indelible impression on, on the public at that time. He was fortunate to be there when he was, and he made the most of it. The Wolfman made Lon Chaney Jr. a star, and Universal Management rushed to put the actor in every kind of horror sequel and remake they could sink his teeth into. Chaney was asked to become the first actor to fill Boris Karloff's boots as the Frankenstein monster. There's a curse on our village. The curse of Frankenstein. The Ghost of Frankenstein was a surprise blockbuster, proving to Universal that their classic monsters were virtually indestructible and that the Chaney name meant guaranteed box office. They wasted no time in casting Lon in another role created by Karloff. A creature that's been alive for over 3,000 years is in this town, and it's brought death with it. We've got to run it down. As much as he loved his portrayal of Lenny and of Larry Talbot and the Wolfman, he equally despised the mummy because he was 
wrapped from head to toe in gauze bandage and he had one eye covered and the only thing that was really showing was, was one eye. Uh, on his entire person. It took eight hours to put him into the makeup. And so Jack Pierce and the directors and producers who would do the films had devised a system where they would put maybe his hands into makeup for one day, his feet into makeup for one day, uh, for close-ups, his head and shoulders. And they would only do the full body wrap whenever they were going to do uh, medium or long shots. And in fact, uh, Jack Pierce even built a rubber mask for long shots so he wouldn't have to go through the eight-hour makeup ordeal. If one monster in a movie could be profitable, why not try two? As they did by teaming Lon with Bela Lugosi in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. In Son of Dracula, Cheney stepped into Lugosi's trademark cape as Count Alucard and ventured from Transylvania to the Louisiana Bayou country. And sometimes there's a small cloud of swirling vapor. In this way, it can move unseen among its enemies. Son of Dracula is a stretch for Cheney because Cheney, the regular, gregarious, happy-go-lucky, compassionate fellow, is thrust into a part where all of those particular character elements are totally missing, they're devoid. He has to portray, in essence, a Bela Lugosi, aristocrat of evil, and he does it effectively well. In 1943, Lon received a reprieve from his monster roles when he was cast as a doctor wrongly accused of killing his wife. I made a film with him at Universal called Calling Dr. Death, which was about a doctor whose wife was brutally murdered. I played his nurse. And I was actually the murderer, but you don't know it through most of the film. And he hypnotizes me with a gold watch, and I tell the story. And uh, it, it was a lovely experience. He was a wonderful actor. I mean, he, he never forgot a line. You know what interests me about actors like Lon Chaney and, and, and Boris Karloff and Vincent Price? That you don't have today in the so-called horror movies. They all had a vulnerability about them, but there's always that little touch of pathos, and I rather like that. I remember when the film was over and, and we had the rap. He came over and he, it astonished me. He put his arm around me, you know, and said, thank you so much. You know, it was lovely working with you. And I was very touched. In just two years, Lon Chaney Jr. was so well known that he could forever drop the Jr. from his name. But that wouldn't stop the inevitable and not always favorable comparisons with his late father. I suspect that Cheney Jr. was such an unhappy man because he was being forced into a mold which uh, perhaps he really didn't want to take the mantle of his father and be the second man of a thousand faces. Lon's career frustrations were offset by a happy domestic life. Unpretentious and good-natured, the 38-year-old father of two enjoyed hunting, fishing, and camping. He was very affectionate with us. I always remember him hugging us, and pictures we have, I always seem to be in his lap all the time, and he had a big smile on his face, and I think he was a very big and warm-hearted person. He was such a kind man that family members have said there was never a time around Lon's house when there weren't other actors around. And we're talking about not stars, but struggling actors. People who wanted to be in the movies, and Lon would give them a hand. He would put a roof over their head. He would feed them. He'd known hunger as a child. He watched out for his fellow performers. Of course, Lon's regard for his fellow performers did not preclude him from pulling more than a few pranks. Cheney would go into Evelyn Anker's dressing room, along with Broderick Crawford, and they'd mess everything up. That, they thought that was a joke. Or they'd leave some sort of a small snake or something uh, in her under, undergarments. Uh, she didn't find that funny. In 1944, Universal pulled out all the stops by pooling their most famous monsters in a creepy jamboree entitled House of Frankenstein. We knew that right from the beginning they said, Donna Lena, this is a million dollar picture. This is, they're putting a lot of money into this. Last night I killed a man. You didn't know what you were doing. Oh, but I did. I wanted to kill. I don't think we ever walked a scene. He just came out and we did it. I think that's something the director wanted, probably, was to scare me. 
where they had said, don't worry whether or not, don't, if you're frightened and can't scream, don't worry about it because we have a professional screamer on the set and she'll take care of it. Well, he came at me with that, 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 that thing on his head and I, I let out a screech and they didn't have to use any professional screamer. He did a transformation, as many actors do, once they get into wardrobe. I remembered feeling what he was going through, and he really felt and believed what he was doing. Between 1941 and 1946, Cheney made more than 30 films for Universal, including two more stints as The Mummy, another appearance as The Wolfman in House of Dracula, and several atmospheric crime melodramas as part of Universal's popular Inner Sanctum series. Count Dracula sleeps in this coffin, but rises every night at sunset. Chick is right. This is awful silly stuff. But by 1948, Universal's monsters had passed their peak in popularity. Instead of frightening post-war audiences, the Wolfman, Dracula, and Frankenstein's monster were now seen as objects of fun. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein mark the official end of what has become known as Universal's horror cycle. Changing audience tastes demanded newer, more sophisticated horrors, and Lon Chaney found himself largely out of work. As an actor, he had survived fire, swamps, wooden stakes, and of course, silver bullets. He had even survived Abbott and Costello. But now an even greater question remained, could Lon Chaney Jr. survive himself? The 1950s were a boom decade of post-war prosperity. Suburbs, shopping plazas, and freeways spread like weeds across the landscape. But in sharp contrast were the declining fortunes of many Hollywood studios. The infant medium of television was rewriting the rules of popular entertainment forced a sharp reduction in the number of motion pictures produced each year. With film roles in short supply, Lon Chaney returned to the stage, scoring a hit in the touring production of Garson Kanan's Born Yesterday. Here, the affable actor could demonstrate his long-neglected flair for comedy. But offstage, Lon found it more and more difficult to mask his chronic depression and alcoholism. Nowhere was this problem more embarrassingly demonstrated than on a live television version of Frankenstein in 1951. He was doing a live television show where he took all of his liquor and put it in spirit gum jars all around the makeup studio. And as the shooting would progress, he would slip into the makeup room and he would take a drink out of the uh, spirit gum jars. And a little kid saw him do it. And he said, what are you drinking? And Lon said, well, it's a new spirit gum, kid. It works from the inside, you know. She thinks that the live performance is a rehearsal and goes through the live performance as if it were a rehearsal. And when he is supposed to break furniture, doesn't break the furniture, but places it down very carefully, but just goes through the motions and was completely unaware that he was going out on live television. In later years, he was known to have said, get everything you can on me before noon, because after that, I'm not going to be any good. Whether it was noon or one or two or whatever hour it was during the day, Lon Chaney knew his limits as an actor. It wasn't about to stop drinking just because he was making a movie. This public display of Lon's very personal problem caused casting agents and producers to brand him as unreliable. Although he continued to find work, his film roles were now largely limited to B pictures. As he had in the 1930s, Lon was again playing dozens of cowboys, gangsters, and heavies. In many ways, Lon Chaney was back where he started. Only rarely was the actor given a chance to rehabilitate himself, as he did in 1952, giving a brief but memorable performance as the reluctant ex-sheriff opposite Gary Cooper and Grace Kelly in High Noon. In 1957, Universal Pictures released The Man of a Thousand Faces, a big-budget cinematic tribute to Lon Chaney Sr., starring James Cagney. By recreating Lon's most memorable makeups and by dramatizing the actor's seemingly selfless efforts on behalf of his son, 
the largely fictional story canonized the silent star for audiences barely old enough to have seen one of his pictures. Nearly three decades after his death, Lon Chaney Sr. was still a star, and his son could not outshine him. Making matters worse, what starring roles he was offered were usually in low-budget horror films and shockers. <laughs> Inside this strange, forbidding plantation, on the edge of the death-laden bayous, there is a horror beyond belief. Beverly Garland as the unwelcome visitor, haunted by the fear that the man she loves has become one of them. Lon Chaney as the hook-armed, hate-maddened Cajun. I'll kill you, alligator man! Just like I'd kill any four-legged gator! I was so fascinated that I was going to work with him because First of all, he looked like the wrath of God and it scared me to death. I don't know why he scared me, he just did, you know. Uh, and of course, I'd heard so much about his father and him and everything and all the things that, you know, his dad had done. And so, and I, so I was really, he was kind of like my star. He had this hand and he had a, a hook on it because he plays this crazed man that lives in the swamp. You ought to have better sense, sweetheart. Nobody goes out in a swamp on a night like this. And he's a drunk. Me too. And he's a mess. And uh, he's scary as hell. And he looks scary as hell. That's it. That's it. And he grabs me and, and wants to rape me and takes me to his cabin. And then I'd sit down and talk to him and I'd realize what a sweet guy he was. He wasn't scary as hell. I don't think he ever, I don't think Lon Chaney Jr. ever got to play what he really wanted to play or became what he wanted to become. Uh, you know, he, he was always kind of the second banana and I think he wanted to be more than that. But by the end of the decade, audiences began rediscovering Lon Jr.'s classic screen roles on television. Magazines like Famous Monsters of Filmland paid tribute to Karloff, Lugosi and Chaney in feature stories, interviews, and pictorials. The classic monsters were back in style, and Lon Chaney Jr. would have one more chance to howl at the moon. Lon? Oh, hiya, Boris. Peter. Well, hello, Pete. In 1962, television's Route 66 featured a special tribute to three of Hollywood's grand masters of menace, in a Halloween episode entitled Lizard's Leg and Owlet's Wing. But as gratifying as it was for audiences to witness the teaming of Boris Karloff, Peter Lorre, and Lon Chaney, an even greater thrill was provided by the sight of Boris and Lon in their most famous makeups. That proves it. The old ghosts are the best after all. And the power of all three of us in one picture. Can you imagine it? Why, it's almost too ghastly to contemplate. In 1963, Cheney teamed with Vincent Price in The Haunted Palace, one in a series of popular Edgar Allan Poe adaptations directed by Roger Corman. In Witchcraft, released by 20th Century Fox in 1964, Lon played the first warlock role of his career in an atmospheric tale of the resurrected dead. The Whitlocks have used that cemetery for 800 years. What right does an upstart like you have to run sewers through their coffins, put buildings over their graves? He has led you away from the old religion. You have disobeyed our priestess. That's not true. I'm your servant. I respect and worship you. We shall be ready. For the next several years, Lon continued to find work in films and television, but years of heavy drinking had taken their toll. Deteriorating health limited his appearances to occasional guest roles and bit parts. By now, he was more of a personality sought for his name than an actor hired for his performance. A less courageous man might have retired, but Lon Chaney refused to give up. What surprised me is how many movies he actually was in. 
I remember him being very ill. And then I look at his filmography and his career and it just amazes me. He was working the whole time. I thought he was laying in bed sick or sitting in his chair, that he was still up working and quite active. Together in one film, they meet in a fight of fright, Dracula versus Frankenstein. I did a little cameo in a film called Dracula vs. Frankenstein, and Junior played a part in it. It was kind of pathetic to see on the screen because now his face showed the ravages of alcoholism. He was very ill. You know, his drinking caused a lot of problems with his health. And uh, he was always such a big man, but as I was growing older, he didn't seem so big. And at the end, he was very thin. I don't think he wanted too many people to see him. We were down there visiting, and he started telling me different stories and kind of reminiscing, and he kind of fell asleep. And I guess that's the last time I really saw him. On July 12, 1973, Creighton Tull Cheney, the man who began his life as a helpless infant fighting for breath in a frozen lake, died of pneumonia. But Lon Chaney Jr., the actor whose films continue to delight millions all over the world, enjoys the kind of immortality reserved for an elite few. With Chaney Jr., it, it seems to be pretty much the, the role of the wolf man that is so attractive to all of his fans. The wolf man will live again and again and again. <laughs> More than two decades after his death, the image of Lon Chaney Jr. continues to adorn everything from t-shirts and caps to posters and dolls. His films and videos are among the most watched of all time, even eclipsing those of his father. And at theme parks like Universal Studios Florida, the Chaney tradition is kept alive and well. Helping to maintain this tradition is the actor's grandson, who, along with Sarah Karloff and Bela Lugosi Jr., actively supervise the interests of their famous families. The three of us are involved with a petition to the Postal Service for a stamp set series honoring um, Bela Lugosi, uh, Lon Chaney Jr., and, and my father, Boris Karloff. Being from acting family, especially the horror genre, we had a lot in common. And we just thought what a great thing it would be to have stamps issued in all of their behalves. It just gives me a great sense of pride, and I just try to do the best so people don't forget him. I really must say that I remember him with warmth, a charming man. He was honest. I mean, he, he was good. He was good. He was fun. I liked him. He had his own magic. I thought he was a charming actor. I think his career speaks for itself, and I don't think he had any regrets. I think he loved every minute of it. When he passed away, it kind of rang through my head, you know, Maria Ospenskaya's line over Larry Talbot's body in The Wolfman. The way you walk was thorny, through no fault of your own. But as the rain enters the soil, the river enters the sea. So tears run to a predestined end. Your suffering is over. Now you will find peace for eternity.